In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, you've, you've had the concept explained to you that I'm going to be preaching through the Eucharist in a different way uh, through Lent, uh, stopping at different points in the Eucharist. And I'm reminded this morning there's, there's uh, someone here who belonged to my former congregation in Bridge of Allen. And I remember when I was leaving there, we were engaged in a conversation about the altar because it was stuck against the, the wall. The, you, you, the priest had their back to the congregation, and there was a big debate about that. It's been resolved now. But I remember. Um, we had a temporary altar, and we experimented with where it should be, and it was said that people in the village used to turn up on a Sunday just to see where he'd put it next. Um, The sermon slot is going to be a little bit like that through Lent. I don't know whether you've given up anything for Lent. Um, These days I often think of taking something up for Lent rather than giving up a bad habit. Um, But in the tradition of the church, there is this idea of giving something up. And indeed, in the church that I was just talking about, uh, when I worked there, there was a wonderful woman who came to the midweek service every week. She was from a very churchy family, the sister of a priest, married to a priest, a very powerful woman in the church herself. And she used to come along every week, and because the service was always on a Wednesday, we always met on Ash Wednesday. And one of the things I remember about her every year on Ash Wednesday is that Every year there used to be a lot of chatter over tea as to whether they were giving up biscuits for Lent. And someone would say to her, what are you giving up for Lent? And this good woman used to look everybody in the eye and she used to say, bad thoughts. I thought it was the perfect answer. If only it was easier to do. But easy isn't what Lent is about. The most difficult Lenten discipline that I ever undertook was the first one that I undertook on joining the Episcopal Church. I grew up in the Salvation Army, where we didn't have Lent, although we did have something called self-denial in February, which was very similar. But we also uh, didn't have alcohol or any intoxicants. That was part of the deal when you belonged to that organization. You didn't drink. Which is, somehow how, which is how I managed to make it to being a postgraduate student at the age of 25 who had never had a drop to drink. I recognize that it is more normal to give up alcohol for Lent. However, I did join the Scottish Episcopal Church in my second year as a theology student and became the first student in all of Christendom to give up being teetotal for Lent. <laughs> I'm not sure I've got that much wisdom to offer from that time other than that whiskey and cider do not mix. And to be honest, uh, I only occasionally have a drink now. If I do have one, it's a rare one. This is a rather long-winded way of getting me to the fact that I've given up preaching on the Bible readings for Lent, and I'm going to preach this series of teaching sermons for Lent, and instead of focusing on the Bible readings, focus on a key point in the Eucharist each week, allowing us to pause and stop and think about what's going on. This week I've stopped at the confession and absolution, just to rest a moment and to think about what we make of these words and what they do to us. I want to preach this way because I think it is important that if we are a Eucharistic people and we put ourselves in the way of the liturgy, then it will resonate around us and resonate inside us. It will reappear in our consciousness when we need it, not just when we're in church. The words that we say each week make and remake us. They shape us. They take their part in building us to be the people that God wants us to become. God is love, and we are God's children. There is no room for fear in love. We love because He loved us first. May those words come back to you when you need them most. There is no room for fear in love. Countless times in Scripture we encounter people being afraid. From the shepherds on the hillside at Christmas to the disciples startled by the risen Christ, 
at Easter, the message from on high is the same. It is, do not be afraid. There is no room for fear in love. We remind ourselves of that before the confession because the confession is part of being able to make us live without fear. God, our Father, we confess to you and to our fellow members in the body of Christ that we have sinned in thought and word and deed and in what we have failed to do. What we acknowledge when we are saying those words, well, it's a bit like what we acknowledge at other times in the week. I acknowledge it when I listen to the radio these days or read the newspapers. The world is not the way it should be. Things are not the way they should be. But in the confession, we acknowledge that and our part in it. And we acknowledge that we can do something about it. We are truly sorry. Forgive us our sins and deliver us from the power of evil for the sake of your Son who died for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, confession relates to two aspects of life when we're not together. Firstly, having the confession in church and making that part of our lives is part of what shapes us into being a people who will own up when we get things wrong in our lives anywhere. That's how the liturgy in church is supposed to affect you. It shapes you. It makes you different. That should be part of the consequence of coming here, that the words make a difference and make you new. And for goodness sake, if the liturgy doesn't do that, Go find a place where it does. It makes us different people. And secondly, just a reminder that the church also offers the chance to engage in the sacrament of confession in private with a priest. I have received the sacrament of confession or penance both as a penitent and as a confessor, and I would describe both as a great gift a place where God does business with us. The rule in our church is simple about private confession. It is this, very clearly. All may, some should, none must. But it is simply available and important sometimes to remember that it is available. Every priest in this church has to offer the possibility of private confession or point someone towards someone else who can immediately. That's available in this church and the clergy are happy to be approached at any time, Lent being a particularly good time. But what's that about? And what is this about when we hear words of forgiveness spoken? I was involved in a trial recently in a court And one of the most important bits after a long, horrible process was when the sheriff on the bench said, I have heard the crown witnesses, one of whom was me. I have heard the crown witnesses, and they have been both credible and reliable. I actually already knew that I was telling the truth, but it was quite something to hear someone else say that they believed me. Confession is about telling the truth to God, knowing who we really are in the world, being honest, facing up to the stuff that we would rather not face. And the promise is the same for people who confess in private or in a service like this. If we are honest, we will be told the simple truth. You are forgiven. For God, who is both power and love, will forgive us and will free us from our sins, will heal and strengthen us by His Spirit, 
and will raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.